grew up listening to lots of music, uh, a lot of Irish music, a lot of uh, jazz, African, Pakistani music, all different kinds of music from all over the world. Uh, started my first band when I was 12. I was always the singer in rock bands, mostly heavy rock bands, you know. Um, luckily, I had five older sisters and two older brothers that had a lot of uh, a lot of interest in music, so I was able to check out a lot of concerts at a really young age. Started going to stadium shows when I was five. Well, when I was in college, I was playing a lot of gigs. Um, at De I was going to DePaul University and um, playing. You know, living in Lincoln Park, there were a lot of places where you could go. Like I could I could write songs and play solo acoustic gigs at open mics and try out new songs. I, I had a rock band that I sang and played flute and guitar in and I uh, would go to the blues jams and play flute at Kingston Mines and Wise Fools Pub and there were a lot of a lot of opportunities for a lot of different kinds of things. I played at, uh, would go over to Wild Hair and play reggae with guys, you know. And then um, I got a job tending bar, waiting tables originally and then tending bar. Became an assistant manager of a of a place, and uh, I booked bands a little bit with the college uh, when we needed rock bands or blues bands for certain things. I got involved with the activities board there, um, and then just uh, back in '89, I um, had been playing with a bunch of different people for a long time, and I was uh, I was 22 years old when we when we opened a place called Shuba's on, on Belmont and Southport. And um, that was originally not, it was, it, it had previously been a music venue, but it, it wasn't a music venue. It, the business plan wasn't to be a music venue, but I, you know, it was a new place. People weren't coming in. The neighborhood wasn't really that happening at the time. So um, I had friends that, that had bands and we uh, were able to convince the owners to let us have our friends band play and uh, the first band we ever booked at that pl at, that I ever booked at that place with a friend of mine Joe Bill who is a, a good friend of mine who's a stand-up comedian uh, and I was with him at the Annoyance Theater and stuff um, we had a friend Matt Need who managed Big Head Todd and the Monsters so we uh, we did a show we got a little PA on a stick Big Head Todd played and we sold all the beer we had no beer left so then Mike Shuba was like you know can you do this again and I'm like, I don't know, I, I got friends that play in bands, you know. And I started booking bands, and the shows were doing well right away. It's a small room. It was, wasn't that hard to fill. And luckily, you know, the, the owners of Shuba's were committed to spending money on advertising, and that, that helped get the word out on that place. After about four years, I uh, kind of wanted more than what was available to me there, and I just moved on. There was a, a back history to this building for me. There was a place here called uh, called Quicksilver, um, which was kind of a the place was kind of a mess. It was a new place that this guy wanted to open. Um, he had too many. He had kind of different ideas working in the same space. It wasn't really a focused effort. He kind of brought me in, leading me to believe that it was going to be a rock club, and it ended up being more of a family style Italian restaurant slash coffee house vibe. Um, it was a really strange, strangely laid out and weird looking place. And uh, I was kind of stuck because I had already contacted Adrian Ballou and Andy Summers and all these people that I knew and, and uh, a friend of mine, Willie Porter, and all these, he, Willie was making a new record and all these people that I knew that I knew would do really well, I started booking all this stuff. So I booked like three months of gigs and I got all this press on the opening of this place and then it wasn't, it wasn't the place that it was supposed to be. I had to bring in a PA and get some lights and buy some ads and it was a total fiasco. But at, at that time, I got to see this building and see what it would what it could be, you know? Um, so I kind of sketched out my own design for the, uh, for the room. And there was this, uh, this sound engineer that I knew, Jack Letourneau said, you know, this place is all wrong. The stage should be over there. And, uh, when I looked at it, I'm like, yes, that's exactly where the stage should be. The way this room was laid out. And, um, 
So anyway, I, I wrote this business plan and told the guy, even though I had no money at all, that I wanted to buy him out of his business because he was not going to be successful here. And he said, uh, no way. You know, I said, okay, see you later. And I went and I was the talent buyer for the Vic Theater. And I was working at a little bit with a recording studio called Warzone, uh, doing some engineering there and getting some bands in for studio time, re record projects and stuff. Because I had always been producing and engineering and doing sound the whole time, <laughs> doing a lot of recording. And uh, so eventually, you know, quick, pretty quickly, the business that was in this building was out of business and uh, he had defaulted on his lease and he had, you know, had everything was turned off, you know, the electric was cut off and everything was, everything was done, you know. And um, I had a meeting with the owner of the building at the time and uh, showed him my business plan and said I wanted to put a venue in there and he said he liked the plan and uh, I made a deal with him and then I had to go out and get some money because <laughs> I had none, you know. But uh, thankfully through some friends and some family and we got enough to just like give him some down payment and start paying the rent. And I came in here with a bunch of my friends from the Annoyance Theater and we just started tearing the place apart with sledgehammers and pry bars and sawzalls and just, you know, got rid of what was here completely and started building a new place. Luckily for me, all the, a lot of the infrastructure, the, the main electric service and main plumbing and all that stuff had been done by the previous business. And there was a kitchen and all these things were, were there. They weren't how I wanted them, but it didn't take a lot of an investment to, to move things around and change it to what I needed it to be. Um, and then uh, we built a, a big stage, you know, when we were building, when we were, um, Putting together the stage, I had I had partners for about the first year. I had uh, three guys that, that were old friends of mine that I started this place with. And I remember when we were building the stage, you know, when it was a construction site and it was just like we were just putting plywood down on the stage, it looked enormous, you know. It was like we were walking around on this thing, you know, and there's without without all the monitor wedges and the and on the gear on stage, it was it just looked like a huge space. And they're like, "This is way too big. This is way too much space to dedicate to the stage," you know. But I was like, "No, it's not. It needs to be big. It needs to be the biggest stage for any venue this size. It needs to have its own acoustic environment and sound good, you know, because I think the biggest problem that all these venues make and all these small clubs, you know, clubs on at this size level, one of the biggest biggest mistakes they always make is they they design a room that they think looks cool or or has a certain kind of vibe or whatever. And then they think they can make it sound good by putting gear in there. They think they can put a PA in there and make a room sound good. And you can't do it that way. You first have to make the room sound good. And then you could put a PA in there, you know, and any kind of PA you put in there is probably going to be okay as long as you have the acoustic environment and a space, a stage where people can hear themselves and hear each other. And that's like, that's where you put the walls, that's how high the ceilings are, that's, that's what, what is on all those surfaces. And, and all kinds of people fall in love with the, the look of their ceiling or the look of their stained glass or, you know, something like that. And the place will never have a chance of sounding good, you know. So that was my focus, was to, to, was to create a, a real big stage where somebody would be very comfortable and hear themselves and hear each other and be able to play a really good gig, you know. And I wanted to have a big dressing room, you know, with, with a place where they can get away a place they can take a shower if they need to, you know, um, a, a, a venue where, where a band that's been driving 500 miles can get there and have some good food and take a shower and chill out in their own space and have room to do what they need to do, you know. Martyrs came up because we couldn't agree on a name. And I had a business plan and I needed to go get some money and I had to talk to SBA loan packagers. And I had this whole, this whole business plan with 
with all everything everything researched you know the demographics and the the study of all the competition and all all the stuff was in there but we didn't have a name and nobody could agree on a name so i wrote martyrs on the business plan as kind of a joke like like the story of led zeppelin you know like you guys will go over like a lead balloon you know so they named it they named their band led zeppelin you know this was like if we can't even agree on a name we're or sunk, you know, so I just wrote martyrs on there as kind of a joke, and um, everyone thought it sounded all right, and as long as they weren't arguing about it, I was done with that, time to move on to the next thing, you know. There's a mural that, you know, didn't turn out exactly how I wanted it, but a couple people I know that did it did me a favor and painted this giant mural for me. I needed a I needed a big pad to soak up a lot of sound that would that would slap back off the back wall of the stage, you know, on the other side of the room. And I didn't want just a bunch of onyx or a bunch of sound absorption material there, so I covered it with a with a big mural. And I wanted uh, Coltrane and Hendrix and Bob Marley on it, just those three. And we ended up. Uh, um, through some arguing or whatever, negotiating. Uh, John Lennon and, and Janis Joplin got added to it. And uh, I figured, you know, hey, all those people are dead. So martyrs, we could say, like, the theme is sort of dedicated to people who gave their lives to music, you know. So I had all these friends of mine uh, paint these tables so I've got a lot of tables in here that are they're all hand painted there's been a lot of great shows here um, you know Pete Townsend playing here was pretty awesome being in my sound booth with uh, with Bob who's you know who's who's been the audio guy for the who and worked with every record from before Tommy till now um, and him telling me that it was one of the best sounding rooms he's ever heard in his life. You know, that was pretty awesome. And having Pete play a gig and, you know, and since then, you know, his brother Simon's played here a lot and Eddie Vedder came by and played with him just last month here. And, um, you know, having those relationships with, with bands, like whenever the Rolling Stones are here, the sidemen from the Rolling Stones always play a side gig here. You know, I've got friends that, we're in Jethro Tull, and yes, and all the King Crimson side projects always play here, and um, you know, all, a lot of people that played with Miles Davis played here, and I worked with the Miles Davis Fest, and it's kind of nice to be like, the musicians that I respected most when I first heard them, and I'd read, study the liner notes of my records, um, I know most of those guys now. You know, and this is a place that they, a lot of them consider home when they're on the road and they want to play a play, you know, a little, a smaller gig. And all the guys in Peter Gabriel's band have, you know, played here. And there's definitely, you know, Tony Levin is the bassist in both King Crimson and, and, uh, and Gabriel's group. So those, those gigs are always cool. You know, um, Oregon is a band that I've always thought was like probably the most, one of the most musically brilliant bands I've ever heard, live, especially live. Um, and when they were touring, uh, they're not really playing in the United States much anymore, uh, but Ralph Towner, Paul McCandless, Glenn Moore, and, and Mark Walker has been the drummer now for, uh, he's almost 20 years, I guess. Um, that for me personally has been some of the best best music that has ever happened here just because it's pure purely music for music's sake you know uh, Chris Whitley is a was a good friend of mine and he played lots of shows here I always liked his shows here Adrian Ballou is like uh, just you know the personification of joy playing music you know and and whether it's like super complex math prog rock or, or a pop, more of a pop songwriting based gig with the Bears, it's always, you know, an extraordinary experience seeing Adrian play here. Um, 
And, you know, and there's been a lot of other great shows here. Adele played here when she was 19 years old, you know, and, and she was really fun and warm and friendly. And as soon as she started singing, it was like, wow. You know, you don't hear, you don't hear voices like that. You know, she didn't approach a note flat and get into it. She was just, her sound and her pitch was fantastic. And her, her electric bass playing, which people don't even know. She's a bass player, you know. She's a, she plays guitar, she plays bass. She's, she's a great musician. I kind of wanted this place to be from the musician's point of view, you know. And uh, the music and how the artist is treated is the most important thing. Thank you.